All right, welcome everyone. We have just done a quick transition from the last panel. I feel fired up after that discussion. And I think this training is the perfect kind of next session to give us some tools after we've heard these inspiring stories. So we're just gonna wait a second for people to get settled in as we see everyone's coming in from the waiting room. All right, I think we can get started. So welcome to this nonviolence training with Rivera Sun. Rivera is an author and activist who has written numerous books and novels, including the Dandelion Insurrection and the award-winning Ariara series. She is the editor of Nonviolence News and the program coordinator for Campaign Nonviolence. Her articles are syndicated by Peace Voice and published in hundreds of journals nationwide. She is also an advisory board member of World Beyond War and on the board of Backbone Campaign. And I also want to thank our sponsor for this session, Michael Knox and the U.S. Peace Memorial Foundation. And Michael is here. I don't know, Michael, if you want to unmute for a second, but thank you for sponsoring this conference session. Yeah, it's my pleasure. I'm really looking forward to this session. Wonderful. And with that, I will pass it over to Rivera to start the training. Great. Thank you so much, Greta and Rachel and everyone at World Beyond War. Michael, thank you for sponsoring this and helping everything happen. I can see many of you on my screen. So let's do a little like hand poll and let's see. Raise your hand if you have learned something that inspired you in this conference. Oh, okay, that's great. Uh, raise your hand. Oh yeah, if you can, you can also raise your digital hand, that's cool. Uh, raise your hand, either real or digital. If you've heard something that challenged you, made you think twice about something. Oh, awesome. That's fabulous. Okay. Give those digital hands a chance to come up and down. Raise your hand if you are ready to learn something that might be useful in doing this work yourselves, which I think you're all doing. Raise two hands for that. <laughs> Great. All right. So I can tell you are all ready for this session. So um, I'm Rivera Sun. I do this training in strategy for nonviolent movements with a wide variety of groups, people working for peace, justice, uh, anti-racist work, uh, gender equality, LGBTQ rights, uh, wide range environmental issues. And, you know, I honestly don't get to do it for a whole crowd of anti-war activists that often. So I'm really delighted to be here. We know this nonviolent stuff is powerful. We know it is the bedrock of the means that become the ends in the making uh, for anti-war and the abolition of war. Today, I'm really going to share with you kind of the architecture of how this stuff works. And we got a great introduction to that in the keynote from Jorgen. But we're going to go deeper with that, and we're going to really uh, see the kind of the nuts and the bolts and the um, how the toolbox can be applied so we can be more effective and more strategic at what we're doing. So today we're going to talk about tactics and types of action and how, you know, there are different kinds of actions and they don't all work the same. We'll talk about the architecture of successful movements, some of the common patterns that underpin successful campaigns uh, across a variety of issues. We'll talk about the why of how nonviolent action works. We'll look a little bit at like how change happens because there are many different theories of that. And we uh, might get a chance to look at principles of nonviolence and how they're actually strategic. We will have time for your questions, so please uh, share them. Uh, and we will have a breakout session where you can talk with other people about how can you apply what we're talking about to your work? What are some elements of this training that might be very useful for the, the piece of the big puzzle that you are working on yourself? So you might wanna take some notes about that so you can share that in your breakout rooms later on. So, 
In the World Beyond War conference, we've been talking about a lot of different kinds of nonviolent campaigns for which what we're going to explore in this session is really helpful to know. We've talked a little bit about stopping or ending wars. So things like the women of Liberia's mass action for peace that halted the second Liberian civil war, for example. Uh, we're gonna talk, this kind of work is really useful when we think about how nonviolent struggle can replace the use of military in war, uh, particularly we see that in terms of what could have been a civil war, but instead was a nonviolent struggle. We just heard from a uh, coordination of, of solidarity with Honduras uh, and ousting a dictatorship. That could have been a violent struggle. And indeed many uh, resistances to dictators have been. We're gonna look at how the, these tools and strategies can be applied to resisting military occupations and also CBD, which does not refer to, refer to marijuana, but actually refers to civilian-based defense, a theory of how we can use nonviolent struggle to defend nations, uh, potentially even to the point of not needing militaries whatsoever. We have heard from uh, unarmed civilian protection people last night and uh, throughout this conference. One of the uses of nonviolent struggle is in preventing harm to civilians and mitigating some of the worst damages, also reducing the risk of um, the violence and doing violence prevention in frontline zones. Of course, nonviolent campaigns have been used to constrain or hopefully eliminate militarism. And I know a lot of you are working on angles of that. And in World Beyond War, our end goal is not any of the above things we ju I just mentioned, but actually the total abolition of war. And so as we're thinking about these strategies, let's remember that this is the big vision that we are working towards. So I'm gonna start with a tactical toolbox. And the reason we wanna start with a tactical toolbox is because nonviolent tactics, there are over 300 different tactics. There should be because nonviolent struggle has been a lot around for a really long time. You are actually looking at the site of the first recorded nonviolent struggle in human history. In 1170 BC, tomb workers in Egypt went on strike right here. And ever since then, we've been expanding the toolbox. There are now over 300 different methods of nonviolent struggle, and it ranges from things like dancing in the streets to de-escalate the threat of violence at the polls in the 2020 U.S. elections, to Buddhist monks ordaining trees as monks to stop a clear cut in Cambodia in 2018. Today, we're gonna to look specifically at tools that have been used uh, in the anti-war, anti-militarism struggle. And one of the easily recognizable categories of tools is protest and persuasion. But we're gonna talk about protest and persuasion, non-cooperation and intervention, because they're a little bit like having a hammer, a saw and a screwdriver. All three of those are really useful for building a house but you cannot use a saw like a screwdriver and you cannot use a screwdriver like a hammer. It just doesn't work. Similarly, protest and persuasion and acts that fall in that category are very different from acts of non-cooperation and acts of intervention. And when you know how to use these tools well, you know how to build that house of change that you're looking for. So protest and persuasion has a long history. It has a current use. Uh, this is from, I think, last week in Tuscany, Italy, marching against military installations. It, we think of it as large crowds and banners and signs and flags, all of which you see here. T-shirts uh, are also acts of protest and persuasion. But they can also be individual actions. In 1983, a little girl named Samantha Smith, who was 10 years old, wrote a letter to the leader of the Soviet Union and asked, why, why can't we get along, basically? And to her surprise, he wrote back and said, the last thing the Russian people want is more war. This exchange of letters led to an exchange trip where Samantha and some US students went to meet Russians and helped to de-escalate the Cold War by rehumanizing the people that the US had spent so much time demonizing. Protest and persuasion can also be extremely creative. In 2023, an artist started in Russia started using these tiny clay po 
protesters and photos and digital media to stand in for protest uh, opposing the Ukraine invasion because so many Russians are being arrested. But we know that protest alone often is not enough. Uh, if we think about the Iraq war protests, we certainly saw that pattern. So in order to have um, our organizing be unignorable by the power holders, we have to shift into acts of non-cooperation, where we refuse to cooperate with war as usual or with business or life as usual until the war is halted, stopped, prevented, or the, the militarism is rolled back. A great example of this, actually, is the Christmas Day truce in 1914 and World War I. Soldiers put down their guns from both sides of the, the war in conflict and celebrated Christmas together. Now, this seems pretty innocuous, this act of non-cooperation with shooting bullets at each other. But the next year, the generals had to threaten to court-martial and execute anyone who participated in it again. Because what was going on was that these acts of non-cooperation were leading the soldiers to mutiny, to strike, to refuse to fight, and the trade unions in Italy and Germany to also go on strike, which precipitated the ending of, the, of World War I. It really forced the hand of the power holders to hurry up and end that war. Non-cooperation can also be an individual action. This man, Stanislav Petrov, is responsible for us all being here today. In 1983, he got a message that the US was firing nuclear warheads at, at him. He was a Russian commander on a nuclear base. And he had to make a choice whether he was gonna push that button to drop, to send the bombs back, or if he was going to check for another verification. He was vilified for taking this action, for refusing to just automatically push the bomb. He spent much of his life feeling like he was a traitor to his country, and only in later years did he really get to understand that he prevented nuclear war by waiting for verification. His act of non-cooperation is one of the most heroic stories I have ever heard. Non-cooperation is uh, not just unique to the things we do as peace activists, but some of the tactics that we can use uh, come from very unusual sources. This is a World War II espionage and sabotage manual in the 1940s. The first part of the book actually describes things like how to blow stuff up. But this part of the book actually describes a number of tactics that we recognize. Work slowly, uh, work to rule, do things needlessly, forget your tools so you have to go back and get them, overload the, uh, the telephone systems. This list goes on. It even has things for how, you know, um, public officials can just really stall and slow down occupying regimes. These tactics are acts of non-cooperation, and they are things that we can also use when we're facing uh, war militarism, particularly useful when you are being occupied. This is a part of the framework of civilian-based defense that we mentioned earlier. Non-cooperation also takes things like refusing to go along with ordinary life, right, and making a stink and an uproar, or pledging to take an even bigger stand, um, such as the Pledge of Resistance did uh, to stop U.S. escalation of war and paramilitary groups in Nicaragua and El Salvador. So this took a pledge, which is an act of protest, but said, we will engage in civil disobedience, we will go on strike, we will get arrested, we will blockade doors of official buildings if you do not uh, stop the, the escalation of military intervention. A really specific example of when non-cooperation stopped the war happened in 1905 when uh, Norway and Sweden separated. Uh, Sweden was going to reinvade Norway and take it back, and the workers threatened a general strike against the threat of war. This is actually a photo from a 1909 general strike, but their campaign actually happened in 1905. This is credited with halting that war. The third category that you need to know about, the third kind of set of tools that make us powerful as activists, are acts of intervention. This is when we don't just refuse to go along with life and, as usual, we get in the way of war happening. 
What you're looking at is Colombia's indigenous nonviolent youth patrols. These were organized because the youth were being um, recruited into uh, multiple sides of the armed conflict that's been going on in Colombia for over 50 years. So this was creating an alternative where the youth could be trained and taught nonviolent protection of their communities. But intervention can also look like undercover salting. This is when people joined, uh, men in the 60s, joined the US military intentionally to go organize anti-war activities among the soldiers. This is a great tactic to know about because some of the most powerful agents of stopping wars are the military members themselves. If they don't want to fight, it is very difficult for wars to continue. So as peace activists, one thing to consider is how do we infiltrate the ranks of those who may be causing war and violence? Intervention can also look like uh, a situation that happened during the People Power Revolution of the Philippines. In 1989, um, when the dictator Ferdinand Marcos uh, challenged the legitimacy of the election of uh, Corazon Aquino, uh, the people took to the street by the, by the millions and shut down the city. But Marcos called out the military to go attack a rebel military group that had seized uh, uh, the military bar barracks. It's a little complicated, but to make a long story short, short, the tanks were coming, the fight was about to break out, this whole thing was about to explode into a civil war. And what did the people do? They got in the streets, the nuns went and stood in front of the tanks, they got down on their knees and they prayed to God that the soldiers would stop in their tracks and would not start a civil war. That and the thousands of other people blocking the street uh, prevented the tanks from getting to the army barracks and creating a massacre that led to a bloodbath. And indeed, it enabled the people power revolution to succeed in throwing the dictator out of power. So in addition to knowing these toolbox of protest and persuasion, non-cooperation and intervention, we also need to know about alternative systems where we build the alternative to war and militarism. These can include things like a lot of the work of nonviolent peace force, uh, doing protective accompaniment, reducing the risk of violence, uh, keeping civilians safe. We have to pair these tactics together to create success, successful campaigns. This is one of the most important things for us to understand as activists, that we can't just rely on the same old protests. We need to understand how to escalate our tactics, how to pair our tactics. One of the things about non-cooperation is when you stay home from work and go on strike, often it looks like nobody showed up. So acts of protest can be used to make it visible. One of the things that makes nonviolent action powerful is disrupting, disrupting business as usual, disrupting life as usual, disrupting the war machine as usual. Uh, in this photo, the Italian dock workers are picketing because they're also refusing to load uh, Saudi's weapon shipment in 2020, disrupting the ability of war and weapons to get to the front lines of where they're trying to fight wars. Here's a hat tip to our Canadian friends. Uh, this is a great action that happened in 2021 where they blocked weapons trucks that were headed to Yemen. This is building new systems cannot be understated in the role of stopping war and militarism. We often overlook them, but they are critically important to our success. Colombia's peace villages at great risk to themselves carved out space for people to come and live and exist who did not want to take place in this ongoing bloody civil war. Other examples include the role of peace building right, a constructive action where we go to the parties involved and we try to get them to sit down and resolve their conflicts differently. In Yemen, uh, part of the consequences of the war that was going on is that a well was destroyed and people were getting killed as they tried to cross the city to get water at the other well. The men were unable to resolve this conflict for 30 years until the women, came, some young university women actually came back to their communities and started to organize the other women. 
They got the power holders, the men in this community, to sit down to negotiate this. And like the women of Liberia, they knew that they had to actually hold the men's feet to the fire to get it done. So breaking with some of the traditional values that were present at the time, they entered the, the meeting and they spoke up and they shut down the stalling that was going on. And they brought that situation to a resolution that provided water um, and stopped the shooting of people as they tried to get the water. Other alternative institutions uh, mitigate some of the impacts of war, like Syria's rebel librarians collecting books and building a literal underground library that provides space for people to have refuge from the ongoing war. And sometimes you have tactics that really defy categorization altogether. The Zapatistas, uh, indigenous community in what is now called Mexico, uh, to make the point about colonialism, they invaded Spain nonviolently and claimed it for the Zapatistas to show the Spanish people how ridiculous it was that 500 years ago, they came to Mexico and claimed Mexico for Spain. So one of the things that we learn from all these tactics is to see how people fight with nonviolent action. And while in many social justice struggles, nonviolent action re utterly replaces the use of violence by the movement, what we see in contexts of war is that sometimes these struggles are concurrent. There is a military fighting, there is maybe even a guerrilla group of resistance using guns and weapons, but there is some significant nonviolent action occurring simultaneously. And World War II is actually rife with examples like this. The Dutch bankers funding the resistance that led to a strike that shut down weapons shipments to the front, the Danish rescue of the Jews, the Norwegian teachers' uh, defense of education, the Berlin wives of Rosenstrauss rescuing their Jewish husbands. The list actually goes on from here. And then I just want to emphasize that one of the unparalleled, not just potentials, but actual uses of nonviolent struggle in ending war, abolishing war, is the ways that people are already replacing the use of armed struggle with civil resistance. This describes the struggle in Bolivia from 2019 to 2021. But I think one of the places we see this dramatically is around self-determination and sovereignty struggles by First Nation peoples. Every single time a corporation tries to extract from indigenous land, indigenous people rise up with nonviolent action to push them back and the state powers that back them. You are seeing those groups replace a potential war with nonviolent struggle or civil resistance. Uh, another good example of this is the Maori occupation of land that was stolen from them not 100 years ago by New Zealand, but just a few years ago. Um, retaking the land and refusing to concede it or leave it uh, until the New Zealand government re, uh, releases their claim on that land back to the original owners uh, of the Maori people. I hope that was helpful. Can you raise your hand if that was a little helpful to have that all laid out with those examples? Oh, good. I'm not just talking into the, the void. Um, let me just check your chat box to see if there's any burning questions. Oh, I see hands. Oh, that was your response to my question. Oh, some great examples from Amy in the chat box and David. Wonderful. Thank you. I'm glad you're adding your examples into the chat box as well. If you're like, oh, I know a great example of what she's talking about, pop it in there. We can all learn together. So let me have you raise your hand if uh, you have ever engaged in these acts of protests. Yeah, most of us have. Okay. How how many of us have ever engaged in an act of non-cooperation to stop a war, prevent a war, resist a war, a boycott, a strike? Yeah, some of us have. Tax resistance, a block, okay. And how about if we have engaged in an act of intervention? 
Have you ever blockaded a military base or done civil disobedience? Or were you in those pictures of stopping the trucks? Yeah, all right. You guys are diehards. I mean, live hards um, of peace activists. So, you, you know, usually there's an escalation curve of risk that's associated with these types of nonviolent action. That's why pairing your tactics is so important. It gives people who have uh, lower risk thresholds more places to show up. But we need those acts of non-cooperation and intervention. We know that in order for nonviolent action to succeed, we need uh, our campaigns to be using those non-cooperation and intervention tactics. That is the, one of the single most determining factors, not just numbers of participants, not just the numbers of people in the streets protesting, but the numbers of people who are willing to uh, refuse to go to work because a war might be breaking out, or the numbers of people who are willing to go to a stand between the tanks, right? To use a really dramatic example. So I want to uh, move into a little bit of the architecture of how the, you put these tactics together, because tactics alone do not a movement make, right? Uh, you could do one protest after another, after another, after another for your whole life and not abolish war. It will play a role. It is not unworthy. It is an important thing for us to do. But if we want to be even more effective, We've got to understand how to put tactics together with strategy. So um, one thing I like to talk about is something that I call the staircase of a movement, the stepping stones of a movement. And tactics or your actions are like the little, bright, the little pieces of mortar that make up a stepping stone. Your campaigns are going to be the the tangible, specific goals through which you take step by step by step to achieve the broad aims of your movement. You, your movement will have things like world peace, total abolition of war. That's your movement. Your campaigns are going to break that down into the tangible things you can achieve to do that. Uh, slashing the U.S. military budget, closing bases, um, educating everyone in nonviolent struggle. Those are campaigns. And within those campaigns, your actions are the, the things you do to achieve those, uh, those specific goals. So if you're going to close military bases, you're going to have protests at the bases, you're going to have sit-ins at the legislator's offices, you're going to um, blockade the doors of them, you're going to you know, do bannering and flyering on overpass uh, places, you're going to get soldiers to uh, refuse to go to those bases. I don't know. There's so many things that you could do. If we look at the civil rights movement, there were hundreds of campaigns to achieve racial equality for Black people in the 1950s through uh, 70s. And they act as stepping stones. So if you look at Nashville sit-ins, they happened in 1960. The next, it wasn't even a year later, 15 more sit-in campaigns happened throughout the South. In Nashville itself, they go from desegregating downtown lunch counters to then the next year campaigning to desegregate businesses that are not in the downtown and movie theaters. Hopefully your campaigns are building on each other, not just one after another, but um, in a way that takes the strength and success that you just achieve and expands it. Uh, this may mean shifting from a campaign that is mostly low risk acts of protest and persuasion to get people involved to then doing training of these people so that they can engage in acts of non-cooperation and intervention. So let's peer into the anatomy of a campaign. There's much to understand and all of it helps us be more skillful organizers. I've tried to find examples of people who have done the work we're talking about and put them in the slides so you get a little inspiration that it's not just me talking about this stuff, people are using it in real life. Every campaign is gonna have some broad aims, some objectives, some goals except for Occupy Movement, which, you know, <laughs> famously had no demands. Most of your campaigns are going to have demands. You got to know what you want to achieve. 
And how will you know when you have succeeded? That is what your goals are about. The community of peace people in Northern Ireland knew that they had achieved their goal when the peace accords were signed. Very clear goal. Every campaign is gonna have a target or a focus, right? We're not always just going to be targeting war in general. Sometimes it's a particular military base or maybe it's military recruiters in schools, or maybe it is a tech company that is too cozy with the military intelligence. Um, in the people power revolution, they wanted to get rid of their dictator. That was their target. But when the military started to almost clash, their target or focus was stopping both of those groups from fighting. So who, is, who are you trying to shift? Uh, what's your strategy? How are you going to achieve this? And hopefully you can describe this in not too many words. Uh, a strategy for a campaign is not like, it's somewhere between um, every little detail and we're going to have war peace one day. You're gonna, your strategy is something like we are going to uh, organize a boycott of tech students uh, for tech companies that are too cozy with the military. We're going to get tech students to pledge not to go work for those companies. And because they are pledging to do this, some of these companies are going to drop their military ties. That's a strategy. Which leads us to figure out who are going to be the participants in the struggle. It's not always the general public. Uh, you want to think about who are frontline people affected by this who want to be involved. Who are their, their great and obvious allies? And who are unlikely allies to this struggle? When uh, we were trying to close um, family um, migrant detention centers and uh, stop family separation, one of the groups that came forward that was very powerful in that campaign were survivors of the World War II Japanese internment camps in the US. They could raise a moral point that nobody else could on this issue. And when they mobilized, it made people think about migrant detention centers in a completely different way. Timing. This is one of the things we rarely think about and we need to think about more. So you can um, pay, you can plan your campaign to strike at a particular moment where your opposition group or your target is vulnerable. For example, South Africans, uh, South Africa was considering a, a nuclear deal and actually getting a nuclear weapon. So people campaigned to stop that and indeed they achieved that. Timing may also be things like, are you planning an outdoor occupation in December in North America? Maybe you should wait till June when you won't all freeze to death. Uh, things like quarterly reports for weapons companies may be a great time to try to sabotage their profits. And this ties into duration. How long will your campaign last? Most campaigns are not gonna be forever. Um, ideally, your campaign is going to be specific enough that it is from under a year to three years, but not more. And in my opinion, a really smart campaign or a really smart movement will restructure its campaigns for under, the, under a year long cycle. So when your people get tired, you can switch gears and take on a different aspect of what you're working on. Also, what do you need to sustain your campaign? Do you need to vary tactics? Do you need to get um, like mutual aid and to support a boycott? Um, when or why should you stop and call off your campaign and regroup and start again? And how do you do that without losing uh, face or momentum? There are much more to talk about, including things like messaging and media. You know, how are you going to communicate what you're doing? Um, but after you think through all of this, then you decide your tactics. Tactics do not come first. They come last in a strategic plan. And this is what makes it, takes us from being passionate peace activists to being effective peace activists. We don't just go demonstrate because demonstrating is easy to do. We want to know what our goal is, what our target is, and what is the action or actions, tactics that are going to achieve that goal. 
So I'll pause there for a minute because it's good for me to take a breath. Um, I see, uh, Liz, you have your hand up. Do you have a question for me? And do you want to come off mute and uh, ask it? Oh, hand went down. Great. Wonderful. Okay, I'm seeing your questions in the chat box and I will um, uh, answer those in just a second. Are you on total overload or could you listen to something else? Okay, I'm gonna assume that was a yes. More, says Valerie. Thank you, appreciate that. Great. Well, we have a very short time to really kind of uh, get the key things about nonviolent action to you all. So I'm just gonna do my best to, to get through it. We we're gonna talk about theories of change. One of the great things we know about nonviolent struggle is it doesn't work just by melting the heart of the oppressor. If you can do that, great, that's fabulous. Please melt them. But sometimes you need a hot iron forge. And the theory of change is how you melt something that doesn't wanna melt. It's how you raise the stakes for your opponent and make it costly to them to continue what they're doing. And one of the theories of change that we have is not just that politicians can make change happen, it's that people can. And this doesn't just happen by magic, it happens by science. Nonviolent struggle is actually a science. It is rooted in living systems theory. And it's rooted in the idea that everything is tied together. And if you pull one end of the web, the other end of the web is going to um, move. One of the people who really advanced this without actually talking too much about living systems theory was Jean Sharp, preeminent scholar of nonviolent struggle, when he posited the pillars of support model. This is the idea that dictators or even the war industry doesn't have power just because they're, they seem big and powerful and they have guns. They have power because we, the people, cooperate with them and provide them with necessary resources. This actually goes back to the little, this guy, Etienne de la Boite in the 1500s. I call him the little French dude. He looks like he's 40 in this painting, but he was like 19 when he talked about this. Uh, he wrote that if you resolve to serve no more, uh, you are at once freed. I do not ask that you place your hands upon the tyrant to topple him over, but you simply support him no longer. Then you will behold him like a great colossus whose pedestal has been pulled away fall of his own weight and break into pieces. The pillars of support model says that if you pull enough pillars away from the war industry, it cannot function. If they don't have soldiers to fight, if they don't have tech workers to help them surveil everything, if they don't have um, money to buy weapons, if they don't have laws that let them do it, they cannot exist. So. There are the different types of resources that they need, and then there are the people who provide them. You can think of both of these as pillars and strategize around them. Let's take a closer look. Materials is a broad category. It can include things like technology and manufacturing. It can include things like research and funding, and we know that our uh, universities can be very tied into that. Here are some students wanting their uh, university to stop. It can also be things like space to hold conferences and weapons fairs or for NATO ground maneuvers. Uh, so uh, this campaign, World Beyond War, has been supporting successfully kicked NATO out of their valley. It also describes things like money. Money is a really important material resource for the war machine. But all these material resources don't just show up on their own. They are all provided by humans, right? Bankers move the money around. Uh, mayors of valleys say yes to NATO. Um, you know, the university chair says, yes, we will devote our tech, industry, uh, our tech department to solving your military's problems. So human resources can refuse to cooperate. Remember the dock workers? The ship is there. The weapons are there. What they don't have is the dock workers to put the weapons on the ship. So, no war shipments. 
refusing to to be drafted and enlisted like the Israeli youth are doing as a way of denying human resources to the war machine. We've been talking about tech a lot. Google workers uh, quit en masse against Project Maven in 2018. But some of the other resources are things like knowledge. So all the people are there, all the, the um, resources are there, but the military doesn't have the knowledge it needs to get stuff done. Famously, the Catonsville Nine, burning the draft cards is a good example. In the documentary, um, Hell No, I think it's called, or The Boys Who Said No, that's what it's called. There's an anecdote where the soldiers in Vietnam are refusing to translate or to relay the movements of the North Vietnamese, uh, which stopped airstrikes from happening. Uh, knowledge is also, um, you know, spy information. There's a lot of things that can be done. This is from that same manual that talks about how you can resist an occupation by doing things like bringing up irrelevant issues as frequently as possible. Now, if you're like me <laughs> and you've been at a PISA meeting or two, you definitely have seen your fellow peace activists do this kind of stalling and obstruction. Uh, other things uh, can be like making speeches and talking as frequently as possible in, in a meeting with the enemy to slow them down and, gu and gum up their operations. But there are some funny ones of resources. Resources are also things like authority, laws that legitimize going to war, the War Powers Resolution Act in uh, the US, for example. Uh, or the moral authority of what the citizenry want, like the Japanese who rallied against the military expansion in 2023. Authority can also be things like the people saying enough is enough, this war has to end. Um, and challenging the notion that the power holders are saying the people want us to defend our country in this way. This ties into this other category of pillars of support called the intangibles. So things that are, you can't put your finger on them, but they're part of why people um, do or do not support the war in militarism. So things like the Hamlin Peace March in 2020 in Afghanistan was really important for saying the Afghan people really wanted peace. They really wanted all this constant warring to stop. So here's how it works. This is my nice little graphic. If you protest, get the faith groups and NGOs to protest, if students go on strike, if businesses refuse to cooperate with the military, if um, you know they pull the money out of it, if the politicians stop supporting a war and the media stop saying rah, 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 uh, if the legal um, system starts to gum up the war machine, suddenly, whether we're talking a military base or a war or the war industry, it's not in such a comfortable position as it was. It's actually in a little teetery position. And ultimately, it falls out of power. Would you like to see that again? I think this is very encouraging for all of us who are working for change. So pillars of support is something that you can use to think through what, how am I going to get in the way of the pillars that my specific campaign needs to achieve its goals? What pillar can I intervene in? And what resources do we need to intervene in enough pillars so that this problem, this piece of the big war problem, uh, can no longer cease to operate. Does that make sense? You can raise your hand if, if um, yeah, okay. So I would really love to give you guys a chance to talk together in breakout rooms. I've gotten to talk a lot. I see many of you are taking notes. And the point of a training is to apply what you're hearing. So. I'm going to ask Greta to put you in breakout rooms of six for, uh, let's do, yeah, we could do 15 minutes and come back and still have a few minutes for the Q&A at the end. That will give me a chance to read through your questions and think of smart answers for you. Um, in your breakout rooms, make sure everybody has a chance to speak, listen without judgment, uh, be open-minded to how people are thinking through how this might apply to what they're doing. And what I'd love you to talk about is what is something you just heard that it could be really useful on the campaign 
that you are working on. Okay, I'll put that in the chat box so you have it. What is something you heard? What is something you heard that could be useful? All right, Greta, if you can send people to their breakout rooms, if anything goes wrong, get yourself back here. You'll see me on the screen and I'll help you get into your breakout room again or a breakout room. Wonderful, welcome back. I hope that was helpful to start to think through how some of these things could be useful in the work you're doing. My greatest wish is for our peace activists to be the most effective, strategic, uh, I was gonna say badass, badass activists on the planet. Uh, certainly our cause is just, our perseverance is incredible. The longevity of wisdom of people who have been working on this for so long is unparalleled. And I think that if we really think through our strategies, we can achieve some truly remarkable things uh, for humanity on the issues that we care about. So I'm gonna attempt to answer questions. I'm sure there are a lot. There's a lot more to know about strategy for nonviolent movements. So anytime World Beyond War offers a training in that, go take it. Uh, I really recommend continual learning. We briefly mentioned civilian-based defense. It is an incredible concept that we really don't have time to unpack right now, but we should do more on. Uh, some of the questions that came in already, uh, there was a great question about youth in Syria uh, joining the military because of economic reasons. And I empathize so much with that question because youth in the US are facing the same uh, problem as well with a very different uh, situation. But I think one of the things that we can look at a, a, as a peace movement is how do we secure the funding to hire people to wage peace? Constantly a great question. And how can we make that a compelling argument to the people who hold the money, which are increasingly a small group of people? It's also another question about how do we build replacements to militaries? And I think uh, the, in the previous session, there was some uh, discussion of the Bacha Khan's nonviolent army. And I do think it's a, a powerful question of what could we do if we had, you know, 80,000 people to deploy? I mean, nonviolent peace force is always asking this question, right? They have 50 different people working in Ukraine right now, and that seems like a big campaign. What if we had thousands? Um, I think taking this seriously as a concept and investing time, energy, resources is one of the best things we can do to abolish war. And then the third question that was in the chat box was, how do we use these tactics against the rise of fascism in the US and worldwide? I would say the good news about that is there's so many ways and many of them are already be, being done. Also, I think studying the examples from World War II is uh, actually quite illustrative. It's about tangibly denying fascists the specific power that they want, the resource that they want. If they want to ban books in schools, making sure that the schools and the libraries will have a robust library. You know, if they want to attack people in the streets, making sure that we have protective accompaniment for vulnerable populations. Um, it's less about winning a moral battle, which is also great to do. It's about getting in the way of them concentrating power and con grasping onto resources that they use to wreak havoc with on people's lives and dignity. So great, uh, cool. another question, how can we as peace activists be sure that we are effective? That's where you get into those tangible goals. Having a goal gives you a way to measure whether or not you've achieved it. And it's gotta be smaller than world peace, but you need to know how it's gonna lead to world peace. Um, Great. Other, any other questions that people want to raise or ask? You can put them in the chat box. If you want to be brief, you can come off mute. Well, if, if I may say something, I should have said it at the beginning. Um, Rivera, Greta, David, uh, 
Gar, many of the people in the audience and who are presenting, their, their anti-war and peace work is documented in the U.S. Peace Registry, which you can read at uspeacememorial.org. And we've heard in Rivera's presentation and others about specific actions that people have taken. We've actually documented uh, the work of hundreds of anti-war uh, Americans, because our focus is on U.S. peace and ending U.S. militarism and war, but there are almost 900 specific activities that we document. So if someone is looking for things that they might do beyond uh, the things that we've we've heard about in this session and others, uh, there's, a, there's a nice guide there uh, to look at what other people have done, and you might identify with that person and and say, if they can do it, so can I. And there's a broad spectrum of anti-war activities, um, all nonviolent, and uh, you know, as, as simple as writing a letter to your editor to you know civil disobedience that will result in you being uh, incarcerated. So uh, you have a lot of things to choose from. Thank you, Michael. And that is a great reminder. You know, go seek out the stories and study them and learn them. And the Peace Registry is a great place to find them uh, in, in one spot. Uh, I also recommend the Global Nonviolent Action Database uh, and a project I run called Nonviolence News, which collects current stories, uh, things that are emerging and unfolding, not just on peace, but on a lot of social justice issues. And uh, Al, I see your question about uh, UCP and CBD, that's unarmed civilian pr uh, protection and civilian-based defense. Is growing that as an option, a measurable goal that the worldwide peace activist community could rally around? I think so. Um, I think those of us who are peace activists understand what this stuff is about uh, well enough to, to catch the vision of what's possible with this work. Groups like Nonviolent Peace Force, uh, Peace Brigades International, domestic teams like Meta Peace Team, uh, or even projects like Cure Violence um, are all doing uh, quite a bit of this work. And so we can really uh, support their efforts, help popularize it. Um, and then also like keep telling the stories because you know our fellow citizens don't necessarily know them. And David Swanson recommends that we have a read in at uh, legislature and weapon sealers reading my books. Please do. I'd love to see that happen. The RERA series would be a great thing to read there. Uh, so great. Uh, you have all been wonderful. This has been a whirlwind tour of nonviolent struggle. Uh, and I know that you will put this to, to good use in the work that you're doing. It's been an honor to spend this time with you. And uh, keep thinking about these concepts as you listen to the other panels, you will see them at work in the work that these activists have done around the world. And you will be able to see and hear what pillars they've removed from the problem that they face. You'll be able to notice how they paired acts of protest and persuasion with non-cooperation and intervention. You'll be able to spot when they're building an alternative institution um, and providing a constructive action that thwarts war and militarism in their community. This is the science of nonviolent struggle. And nonviolent struggle is the toolbox that we use to abolish war and make it obsolete and irrelevant. So I want to thank you all. And I'm going to turn it over to Greta to just uh, give any housekeeping notes and let you know what's coming up next. Thank you so much, Rivera, and thank you everyone for participating. I feel like there was such an active uh, dialogue and participation in this session. So yes, we have 15 minutes exactly uh, for some networking and expo booths. So we're going to close this Zoom meeting. This screen is going to end. And then you should see your lobby screen behind that. Um, and then from there, you'll be able to go to the expo booths. You'll see the tab across the top that says expo. And you can check out the various booths of our sponsors. I encourage you especially to check out the sponsor of this session. That is Michael Knox and the US Peace Memorial Foundation has a booth. Also, Rivera will be in the session reflections booth. And we have many other booths. So 
take 15 minutes or so, stretch, go to the booths, whatever you need to do. And then we will see you for the next panel and the final panel of the day on nonviolent resistance to the ongoing war in Ukraine. So thank you again, Rivera, and see you all soon. Bye-bye.